If you've got your Bibles with you this morning, if you would turn with me to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. I uh, was thinking on this chapter in Respectable Sins this week. As I'm prone to do, sometimes I'll adjust a little bit and change things and tweak things. And <clears throat> I thought I'd give it a little different title this morning. Um, we're going to be looking at contentment slash discontentment. So if, if you're a discontented person this morning and um, there's things going on in your heart and life that you're, you're, you're having issues with, perhaps the Lord will use this lesson in a special way in your life. It's easy to become discontented, is it not? After two and a half, three months of Texas heat, I become discontented. I pine for the woods and the mountains of Washington State or somewhere cool, somewhere, amen. Um, but I have found that uh, after a while, even this will pass, amen, <laughs> and then we'll be whining about the cold rain and the cold temperatures in January. Some of us this morning perhaps are annoyed with the city of Austin. I can't even begin to imagine why, amen. Um, I could list a, a long list here this morning, but let's face it, God has placed you, I believe, here in Austin for a purpose, amen. For some of us it's work, but let's be honest, whether it's work, wherever we work, God has placed us there to be an ambassador, to be salt and light, that's the priority. You, as you study the life of Paul, we'll look briefly this morning at Paul, you wouldn't know he was actually a tent maker, would you, amen. Now that's something you might think about too as a Christian is what am I really known for? It's good to be known that you do a great job, but I like to think it's better to be known that you're actually a man or a woman of God and people say there's something unique about that person and that you're, you're able to be used of God where he's placed you. This matter of contentment I think is a learning process you'll see as we look in the word of God this morning. I don't think you're, it's something that's learned overnight. You'll find if you're not careful, you become discontented not only with perhaps the materials, possessions, or perhaps the location geographical. If you're not careful, it bleeds over into where you become discontented with the things of God. You say, well, that, that's impossible. Well, if you study the nation of Israel, do you remember they wanted a king? Do you remember that? And God explained to them carefully, here's gonna be how that's gonna go if you really want a king. And you remember God's response to Samuel when he was concerned about Israel wanting a king. He said, no, they haven't rejected you, Samuel. They've rejected me. You'll find in this matter of contentment, it's a learning process. It's not learned overnight. There's some keys to contentment we're going to look at this morning. And then I think if, you're, if the Lord uh, allows, I don't think we'll get to it this morning, but is there really room to be discontented? And I think you'll find there are some areas that if you pay close attention, that God would have us to be discontented with. But look, look at me in Philippians this morning, chapter four, if you would please, verse 10 and following. And by the way, just to preface this, I'm glad to see each of you this morning. Um, if I'm not careful, I can become discontented with, no, you can't, it, it, you can. And God has to remind you sometimes, hey, it's a privilege to teach. Um, it's a privilege to be here this morning, folks. It's a privilege to fellowship with God's people. We may not always like each other, okay? We all have our warts and corns. And the more you learn about folks, the more you learn about them. And if you're not careful, that becomes, but God has asked us and commanded us to love one another. And that should override the differences, it should. Philippians chapter 4 verse 10 says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. Now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want. I have learned, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. And you'll find verse 13 is the key to Paul's life. 
Verse 13 could be the, can be and should be the key to your life. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. I don't want to be in church this morning, so help me, I'm tired of church. I can do all things through Christ. I don't feel like singing the songs of Zion this morning. I can still do all things through Christ. I don't like where God's placed me in the work field. I can do all things through Christ. I think you'll find the key to Paul's life is verse 13. Amen? Yep. Now, let me read a definition to you this morning just to set the tone here just a little bit here regarding contentment. It says a rest, I want you to listen very carefully to this, a rest or quietness of the mind in the present condition. Even under that house, brother, I was talking about. <laughs> I'm challenged with this. How can I be content under a pure and beam house on a 98 degree day laying in, a, in mud and water? Amen. God says, no, no, I'll help you with that. Okay. It says a rest or quietness of the mind in the present condition. Satisfaction which holds the mind in peace. Look at here. Listen here. Restraining complaint, opposition, or further desire. Satisfaction which holds the mind in peace, restraining complaint, opposition, or further desire often implies a moderate degree of happiness. Wow. Do we have any contented people here this morning? It's okay to say, I'm content in Christ. I hope so, right? Now, the other issues God can work on, but you ought to be content with your position, amen, your salvation in Christ. It starts there. Look with me in 1 Timothy chapter 6 before we get going in the rest of this lesson. 1 Timothy chapter 6, if you'll follow along this morning. If you don't have a Bible, look on with somebody. First Timothy chapter 6. Verse 6 says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into this world. It is certain we can carry nothing out. Having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Wow. Now you might back this lesson up, and this will make a great back study from the weeks we've been in here of, of being God was not in all their thoughts. Amen. And an unthankful spirit often leads to discontentment. Okay? So when this starts off here in verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Listen, that's, that's a great verse. Park yourself on there this week, amen, and ask God to explain it further and help you apply it. For we brought nothing into this world. Isn't it interesting how God's word kind of just takes all this chaos and narrows it down to this. We brought nothing into this world. So folks, at some point in life, you have to learn to relax. You're not taking it with, amen? Yeah. Be satisfied with, with the things God's blessed you with is what this verse is saying. Certain we can carry nothing out. Having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Amen? That God's daily provisions. One more, Hebrews chapter 13, if you would please. Hebrews 13. I'll tell you what, it's taken me a long, long time to grasp even some of this. I'm approaching 60. <gasps> Looks every year of it, brother. Listen, but, but this, is a, this is a tough lesson to learn. And you think of the work field, amen? It's highly competitive, amen? Uh, highly competitive. And as you get older, the younger are coming in, okay? You're getting pushed from that side, okay? You're getting pushed from the competition on your own level, amen? There's a push to succeed in life. And men, we have a I don't know, for us, we have a special corner on this, amen? This need to succeed, this need to be successful, this need to have things sometimes. It becomes almost a pressure cooker if you're not careful. And yet God says, oh, hold on a second here. Let's look at some, let's look at some scripture. Let's, get, let's put things into perspective here, amen? I'll take care of you, but let's, say, let's take care of some things over here, amen? Look with me in Hebrews chapter 13, if you would please. Verse number five, it says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. 
Why? He has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Let your conversation, let your life, folks, be without covetousness. And be content with such things as ye have. He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I'll take care of you. In fact, if you're honest with yourself this morning, not only has God met a lot of our needs, he's met a lot of our wants too. In fact, God has met a lot of areas in our life we don't even give a second thought to. And that goes back to thankfulness, amen? And a lot of other studies we've looked at. I don't remember having an issue with, with the car lately, amen? Praise the Lord, okay? I don't recall the last time I couldn't afford to put gas in the tank, amen? I don't remember the last time I had to skip a meal or didn't have food to eat or had a shortage of clothing to wear, amen? God's been very, very good to us. I'll take care of you. Put me first, amen? Yep, order your life accordingly. Now, I've got several, I've called keys to contentment here, and I want you to listen carefully to ask that you turn to these scriptures. We may not finish this lesson this morning. This is not a hurry up, get done so we can get to the next chapter lesson. It just isn't. This matter of contentment is, I think, a very important area in our lives because most of us, if we were honest with ourselves, we're discontented people this morning in certain areas of our life and it ought not to be that way. First key to contentment here is quit your fretting and worrying. <gasps> do I have any worriers here this morning? I don't usually do this, but I'm going to this morning. You carry a drug with this. Why? I have headaches all. Amen? Why do you have headaches all? I fret about things. In fact, I'm anticipating a headache later, so I pack aspirin. <laughs> <laughs> you have psychological issues, but that's probably part of it, too. Amen? But just to show you how a typical American, amen? We fret and we worry. We fret and we worry. Brother, I get angst over the Texas Longhorn in a, in a tough football game. Now, are you kidding me? Amen? It's a game. For crying out loud, life will probably go on. Amen? And yet, I'll be all wrapped up in it. I'll be fretting about Monday, Friday, about the work schedule and how I'm going to meet the needs of the work schedule Monday. Why? Has your fretting or worrying, now think of me here, changed one thing? No. Well, why do we fret and worry? It's convenient. Why pray when you can worry? Amen? Ah, right? Oh, come on now. <laughs> that was bad, wasn't it? Amen? But that's how we are. I don't pray until my back's against the wall and I'm out of answers. It shouldn't be that way, but it's easy to fret and worry. And this fretting and worrying slash anxiety we create for ourselves is really simply a lack of trust in God. Is it not? And guess what? Take it one step further. God calls it sin. <gasps> so in reality, I spend my days sinning against my Heavenly Father and expect God to take care of things anyway. Did you think about that just for a minute? I spend my day fretting and worrying Amen. Sinning against my heavenly father and almost treating God as if he can't deal with what's coming ahead. Do you realize that? God obviously doesn't know and he can't handle it. So I must. And I, here's the thing with this contentment. I said I mentioned it's a learning experience. I am convinced God leaves people like me. Amen. Over in that corner closet with your bottle of Excedrin Amen. And says, when you finally want to learn the lesson, call me. Amen. Meanwhile, if you want to trust in the excedrin and fretting and worrying, fine, stay over there for a while. I can make this easy for you or I can make it difficult or you can make it difficult for yourself. How do you want to go through life? Amen. Quit your fretting and worrying. Look with me in the book of Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, the admonition given to us here. Matthew 6. You know, you can teach on this, praise the Lord, and so help me. It's, it's the applying of it. Uh, pray for me, amen, as I pray for you. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, it says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, 
nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold, the fowls of the air they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? This is a simple question God is asking. Look, I take care of the fowls of the air. Are you not much better than they? He's getting you to think. Which of you, by taking thought, by fretting and worrying, can add one cubit unto his stature? You can't. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Wherefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. First key to contentment, I believe, is quit your fretting and worrying. That's easier said than done. Is it? Is it not? It's easier said. Folks, I, you're not going to believe this. I fret and worry about just teaching a class. Wait a minute, Brother Doug. What are you teaching on? Contentment. Are you not saying that fretting and worrying is a sin against God? Yes. You mean you're sitting against God before you get up to teach a class? Sometimes. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, I think we all could use the lesson. Amen. Yeah. In Psalm chapter 37, we've read some scriptures already about how God's promise to never leave us nor forsake us. Now let me say, if you look at Psalm 37 with me, Verse 1, it says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and withers the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Now, I want you to look at how God's ordered these verses. This is very important. Notice how he's ordered verse 3. It says, first off, trust in the Lord and do good. Um, I want God's blessing in my life. I need God's blessing. I need his help. And God, let's, let's, let me say this, I'm a firm believer, he blesses me in spite of myself, okay? But if you look how this is ordered, there's kind of something, God kind of puts a little bit on our shoulders here. It says, trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Notice the do good part there in the trusting. God wants us to trust in him and to do good. And it's kind of like, now let's keep, let's read here. Verse four says, delight thyself also in the Lord and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Verse five, it says, commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. Verse seven, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger. Forsake wrath, fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. I like this in verse 23, it says, the steps of a good man, again, are still ordered by the Lord. And he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I have been young and now am old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Wow. Interesting, isn't it? Yes, God's promised to take care of us. Yes, God's promised to meet our needs. But folks, you go back to the first few verses, trust, delight, commit, rest. God wants us to do these things. I can do all things through Christ, amen, which strengthens me. I can do these things, amen? Folks, I would sure feel a lot better during the week knowing I'm, by the grace of God, doing the best I can in serving him, amen, 
and watching how God deals with things versus, now think with me here, spending no time with God, not delighting in God, not committing, not resting, still expecting God to bless, then wondering what happened throughout the week. Amen? Right? Huh? At least make the effort. At least, I've said this before, get up to the plate. Amen? Grab that bat and make the effort to do right. God will help you with it. I want God's help. I need God's help. I desire God's blessings. But folks, Brother Doug needs to get up to that plate and make the effort. Amen? To trust in the Lord, to do right, to delight thyself also in the Lord, to commit thy way unto the Lord, to rest in the Lord, to cease from anger. Amen? Yes. I want my steps ordered by the Lord this week. I shudder to think when I order my own steps. What? You, it's like hitting rewind on the week, right? Amen? And God says, you know what? Um, the shortest distance between two points is still a straight line. All you math wizards out there, right? Amen? Instead, you took, the, you took the roundabout way, and I could have saved you a lot of time and my finances. Amen? And all that fretting and worrying, if you just taken... Amen? First step in the key of contentment is learning to quit fretting and worrying. Amen? It doesn't solve a thing. You might think you feel better, <laughs> but you're wasting energy. Amen? And time. Philippians chapter 4. One other here. Philippians 4. Well, does that mean I don't have to pray either? I can just, no, come on, that's all part of it. Amen. Philippians 4 here says, verse 4 in Philippians 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. It'll revolutionize your life. Let your moderation be known unto all men. Why? The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. Again, quit your fretting and worrying. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Yep. Here's my challenge on this first key to contentment this week. Is ask God to help you. Follow along here. When the fretting and worrying starts to creep in, Lord, would you help me to pray about this? Lord, would you, would you, can we have a conversation, Lord? right now to get my mind off of this and to teach me to seek your help through prayer, to seek your guidance through prayer, to seek that peace through prayer, amen, that only you can give in the midst of the storm. I don't think Paul learned this overnight. I think this was a, a, a lifelong lesson for Paul. But if you can be in the middle of a storm at sea and I'm thanking the Lord I haven't been yet, Amen. But I can only imagine that's a fearful thing from my reading. Amen. I've talked to some of the World War II sailors that were caught in some of the typhoons out in the Pacific. And uh, it wasn't a pleasant experience. Lost a lot of ships, a lot of men, a lot of water out there. But if you can be at peace in the midst of the storm, praise God. Amen. Instead of the fretting and worrying. The key to contentment, first one, is quit your fretting and worrying. Here's another one. This is a little trickier. Uh, learn not to covet. <gasps> now there's a positive sign, side to coveting, amen, covet earnestly the best gift, amen. I know there's a positive side to this. But there's also a negative side. And that's the desire inordinately, to desire that which is unlawful to obtain or possess. And I think of Exodus 20, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, wife, servant, etc. amen. Learn to quit the fretting and worrying, but right behind that comes to ask God to help you with the coveting. Well, what do you mean by that, Brother Doug? Oh, come now. What comes to mind when I, when I first read this? What comes to mind about thou shalt not covet? I see Jim's adding to his house over there. You know, I think I need to do that too. He's got a big, I'd like a bigger house. They just follow. You know what? I really like that. It's God has promised to take care of us. Amen. To meet your needs and allow your wants. Where does the rub come in? 
when I become discontented with God's blessings and I desire something he's, he hasn't said I, I can have. Amen? A simple example is going out shopping, amen, with the go-kart, right? And we just buy things. Does anybody like that? Anybody been to Academy or Dick Sporting Goods? Guys, amen? Huh? Ladies out shopping, whatever, right? We don't even party about it sometimes. We just want it. But why? Because I want it. Amen? I have to have, really? <laughs> Luke chapter 12. Well, I don't covet anything, brother. Well, let's read a few scriptures here. Luke chapter 12. Remember Achan? Hmm. Luke chapter 12, verse 13. One of the company said unto the master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. I've mentioned this before. If you've ever been involved in discussing inheritance, it'll bring out the best and worst in you. It will bring out the worst in the sense of how come he's getting more than me or she, amen. That's, that's the part I've learned in inheritance and farming is that why do I just get the doghouse and my brother gets half the farm, amen. Why is that, Dad? Okay, I'm being facetious, but you will find if you want a good test of life, amen, and where your values are, why well, you just start, you just start dividing up the land among the siblings, amen. And you don't, what you learn real quickly is you don't have that giving heart you thought you had, amen. Well, <laughs> where's my share? He said unto him, man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? He said unto them, take heed, beware of covetousness, for man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. He who dies with the most toys does not win. Amen? Let's read that verse one more time. It says, take heed and beware of covetousness, for man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Wow. Quite a little tiff on the farm inheritance thing going on a few years ago. I won't share too much about it. But I'll say this, it's, it's going to tell you a little bit about yourself real quickly. We can sing the songs of Zion one minute, talk about looking ahead to better things, amen. And yet there's something about the old terra firma here, property, that will bring out the worst in people. You'll have them come on out of the woodwork when it's worth some money. And farmland, for those of you, Iowa, Minnesota, and wherever, Kansas, Texas, you know anything about farmland, farmland has gone through, has gone through the roof over the years, cost-wise. Amen? I mean, it's some serious coin. So when you're dealing with serious coin out there, man becomes real interested real quick. Amen? And I'll say this, these scriptures, you better put your nose into. Amen? You better study them and think about it and pray about it. So your gifted land, what do you do with it? Amen, that's another question. What would, Lord, would you have me to do with it? Amen. There's a lot of questions you find yourself asking yourself and scripturally, by the grace of God, pray about it and think about it. Hebrews chapter 13, we read earlier, I want you to go back to this in Hebrews 13, five. Well, Brother Doug, I've never had to deal with land issues. Well, praise the Lord, amen, and it's one less boat anchor, okay? It's one less thing to get caught up in, okay? And I'll say this, if you haven't been, maybe God just hasn't decided to, to bless you with it. It's okay, all right? Uh, Hebrews 13, verse five, it says, let your conversation be without covetousness. Oh, wow, okay? And be content with such things as you have, for again, he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And look with me at the 23rd Psalm. You've probably got this memorized, but I want you to turn there, even if you do, and I want you to look at this, this Psalm. I want you to think with me just for a minute here. Or to quit our fretting and worrying, or to learn not to covet. 
desire those things which God would not have us to have. Twenty third Psalm says, "The Lord is my shepherd." Folks, I don't know how do you improve on that. Amen. Can you claim that this morning? The Lord is my shepherd. Now, because of that, I shall not want. And I'll put in parentheses on mine: whine, complain, murmur, or covet. <gasps> you follow me? The Lord is my shepherd. Therefore, I shall not want. Why? Because God has promised to take care of me. God has promised to meet the needs and the wants. If there's something he thinks you're going to need and will need and, and you do need, he'll take care of it. But here's the beauty of this being saved this morning. If I could just remember this past the Sunday school hour. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me to, beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Folks, if, you, if, you, if nothing else crosses your mind, think of the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. Boy, that covers a lot of territory. Amen? About the time you start thinking you're, you're desperately in need of something, amen, ask the Lord. Lord, you've promised to meet the needs, and you have, and a lot of my whining wants. Lord, is this something I should have? And if it isn't, I pray that you would take that desire away from me. Amen, and nullify it. That's, a, that's all I can think is the best advice is ask God for help with these things. Amen. You're, gonna, you're going to be challenged this week with this. Here's another one. If you look with me in 1 Timothy 6, we read earlier, not only are we to quit our fretting and worrying, hasn't solved a thing, we're to learn by the grace of God not to covet. Um, in 1 Timothy chapter 6 again, I want to draw your attention back to these verses. Um, this is like a reality check. For those of you that like to collect things, and I'm just as bad as the next, amen, my advice is to travel lightly in this life. Remember, and this is the third key, you're not taking any of this with you. You're, can I say that one more time? Because I don't, I don't think we get, I don't get it some days. We're not taking it with. Yep, that means the second I die, amen, it's all staying behind. It's all staying here. You mean I can't, no, 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 no. Do you, if, I, I'm quite sure if God thinks you need it, it might be, it may be waiting for you, amen? But let's be, let's just reality check, guys, men and women, Sunday school class, you're taking none of this with, none of it. So those, those items which we are just bound to determined to hang on to, it's all staying here. Now, the trick to this is, Lord, what would you have me to do with the here and now? Amen. And, and bless me with the understanding that the here and now is staying here now. Amen. What, what am I going to do with it? And what would you have me to do with it? Okay. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, it says, But God in this with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world. It is certain, folks, underline that word certain, we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. And folks, we're out of time this morning. And we'll come back to this next week. I get, I lost track of time a little bit here. We're a couple of minutes past. But listen, you're not taking it with folks. Amen. It'll change your thinking. It will. It'll cause you to look a little harder at what you're thinking is so important. Amen. Let's stand with we'll dismiss with a word of prayer.